Hello and welcome everyone to the Varsity Tutor Star Course series, where in today's class we're going to be exploring the deep blue and its many mysterious creatures with our friends at the South Carolina Aquarium. Today we'll be diving into some pretty exciting deep sea knowledge by exploring the deepest tank in North America, the Great Ocean Tank. Now, before I hand it off to your instructor for today, Elena, to get us started, I want to make sure we are prepared to make the absolute most out of today's live virtual aquarium visit. So throughout the lesson, Elena will have some questions for you, and you'll likely have some questions for her as well. So feel free to use the chat on the right-hand side of the screen to both ask and answer questions throughout the lesson. If we don't get to them right away, not to worry, we're going to save a couple of minutes toward the end of the lesson specifically for Q&A. You'll also want to be sure that you have your cameras close by because toward the end of the lesson, we're going to have the opportunity to lean into the screen and pose for a selfie, possibly with a couple of guest stars we'll be introduced to throughout today's lesson. And if you post those selfies on Instagram and you tag us here at Varsity Tutors, as well as the South Carolina Aquarium, you'll be entered to win a one week subscription to the summer camp of your choice. Now I'll talk a little bit more about that virtual summer camp and the specifics on how to enter toward the end of the lesson. But for now, I'm gonna pass things along to your instructor for today, Elena. Hello everyone. So happy to have you all joining on with us today. Um, I'm so excited to talk about all of my favorite animals at the aquarium, especially the Great Ocean Tank. It's one of my favorite exhibits that we have here. Um, but before we get started, I'm going to share my screen really quick just so you all can be familiar with where I'm joining you from today. Um, so if you are joining us from outside of the United States, go ahead and find yourself on this map right here. And I am over where that red star is all the way at the East Coast of the United States. Um, so maybe you are joining from the US. And if so, I'm gonna zoom in for you. So go ahead and find your city or your state on this map right here. And uh, you can see how close or how far you are away from where I am right now in South Carolina. Um, so we are again at the Southeast end of the United States. And that is a beautiful photo of our aquarium right there. We're so lucky we're right on the water. We are right on the Charleston Harbor, which is right next door to the Atlantic Ocean. So uh, today we are celebrating World Oceans Day and that was uh, last week, but we don't, uh, we celebrate World Oceans Day every day here at the South Carolina Aquarium, especially with a tank like this that you are about to see. So uh, to celebrate, we're gonna meet a lot of different animals that live in this tank and some of those animals are, are sharks. So we have four shark species in this tank. And the two smaller ones that you see up here are going to be our black nose shark and our sandbar shark. And these two shark species are generally about three to five feet in length. Um, we do have some larger species in here as well. Um, includes our sand tigers over here. They're generally seven to 11 feet long. And then the largest shark in the tank and the largest fish in the entire aquarium is gonna be the nurse shark. And our nurse sharks uh, can be anywhere from about nine to 14 feet long pretty crazy. Um, they also like to hang out on the bottom of the tank. They also really like the caves um, and the reef systems that we've got going on in here. So we might see a couple tails poking out here and there. Um, but we're also going to talk about their adaptations. So all of the animals in our tank have amazing adaptations that allow them to survive in these ocean environments and these ocean habitats. So maybe you've never heard that word before adaptation. Um, but an adaptation is any trait that helps an animal survive in the wild. So this can be a physical trait. Um, and the most often Often are, but they, this can also be behaviors that animals have learned how to do um, that make them really great hunters in the wild or just help in their survival generally. So I know y'all love hearing me talk and looking at my face, um, but I'm going to turn my camera around so that we can meet the real stars of the show today, uh, everybody that lives inside of our great ocean tank. So Haley mentioned earlier, this is our the deepest tank in North America. It's about 42 feet deep. So you can see the surface all the way up here. And all the way down to the very bottom, it goes down 42 feet. And just in the, the few seconds that you've been looking at this tank, you'll notice that there are a lot of animals in here. Um, so I'll give you guys a second to take a guess of how many individual animals you think are living in this tank. You can take a minute or so to, to guess at home with your friends or family. I will tell you that there are 40 different species in this tank, um, but 40 different species, so those are types of animals. So total, we have 550. 50 animals living together in this tank here. And you're probably thinking, that's crazy. That's way too many animals to keep in one tank. Um, and that is a lot. So here's our sand tiger here. We're gonna get a really nice look at our sand tiger and their mouth. This is our second largest shark in the tank, swimming right past us. 
So keeping all of these animals living together, um, there's a few different things that we need to do to make sure that everybody is healthy and happy in this tank. Um, so this tank with 40 different species, these are all native to South Carolina. So what that means is that uh, every single species that you see in this tank is from South Carolina and you can find them naturally off of our coastline here. Um, so this is representative of what a real ocean habitat would be like off the coast of South Carolina, and that would be an open ocean habitat, our reef habitat that we've got over here, and then underneath our reef we do have the caves that I mentioned our nurse sharks like to spend a lot of time in as well. So there are four things that all habitats need, and uh, one of those things is air, and even though these animals breathe water, that is still an important thing that we need to have in this habitat. We have oxygen pumps that uh, pump oxygen into these tanks so that our animals with gills can move that oxygen past their gills and be able to breathe. We definitely got the water covered. So water is another thing that all habitats need. And I mentioned we're really lucky. We're right on the coast of South Carolina here. Um, that Charleston Harbor is right outside of our doors. So we get to pull that water from right outside. And there are about 385,000 gallons of water in this tank. Another thing that all habitats need is shelter. So you can see we've got a really large reef system in this tank as well. Um, these are not live reefs, but they represent uh, some of the coral species that we would see off of our, our shoreline here. And they provide shelter for these smaller fish, like this pork fish that you see here, that yellow fish with the uh, black stripes on their face. And it also provides shelter underneath in our caves for our nurse sharks and our larger animals that like to live down there too. Last but not least, the one thing that we haven't mentioned yet is food. Uh, but trust me, this tank gets so much food every single day, every single time that this tank is fed. There is about uh, 60 to 70 pounds of food that are put into this tank. And there's a few different ways that we have to feed this tank as well. Just because there are so many different kinds of animals that live here, um, there's a lot of different methods that we have to use to make sure that everybody's getting exactly what they need. So maybe some of you friends watching from home, maybe you have a fish tank at home, um, or maybe you have a fish a uh, friend that has a fish tank. And in that case, what you probably do is you take a handful of that fish food and you sprinkle it across the surface of the water kind of like this. And that actually has a pretty fancy term. It's called broadcast feeding. So every time that you uh, throw that fish food right across the surface of the water, you are giving your fish a broadcast feed. And that is exactly how we feed a lot of the larger fish species at the top of this tank that kind of swim around towards the middle of the water column, towards the surface. <laughs> We've got a trigger fish joining us over here nice and close. And we will throw that food all across the surface of the water. And that is about 50 feet across, but they're not gonna be getting little fish flakes. They get big chunks of salmon and mackerel. And maybe you've heard of salmon or mackerel before. Maybe some of you like to eat salmon at home. Um, this is our really yummy fish that we like to feed all of our friends in this tank. And if you notice, we do not have any salmon or mackerel swimming in this tank. That is on purpose. So we don't wanna feed any of our friends uh, any of their neighbors. We don't want to feed them any of the same species that they live with and that helps to keep everything nice and peaceful in here um, so they don't acquire a taste for any of their tank mates. So that's one way that we can feed some of the fish in this great ocean tank. There's a nurse shark. That's the largest shark in the aquarium. Whoop, and there's one of our sandbars coming really close. We have to feed a few different ways though as well. So we saw some smaller fish that like to hang out over here along the reefs and those tiny fish, those pork fish, and we've got some uh, really small fish that we, there's kind of one hiding over here, black and white stripes, that's called a Sergeant Major. And that tiny little friend there does not need to swim all the way to the surface and compete with those really big, scary, muscular, fast swimming fish up there. So we have a food delivery system for those friends. And this is what it looks like right here. Um, and I've actually got some trigger fish that have been kind of curious about this bucket because they probably associate this bucket with food. So they've kind of been hanging around next to me for the past few minutes. Um, but this is a chum bucket. And this chum bucket has a really long rope attached to it. So what we do for our tinier reef fish, um, it's almost like a scuba eats situation. We lower this rope all the way down the window and we pull on the rope really hard. And when that happens, it releases a whole bunch of food and that's gonna consist of some squid. Yep, <laughs> nice and curious about my chum bucket here. It's gonna release some squid and clam meat, um, some lettuce and some vitamins too. I have a feeling this trigger fish is going to hang out with us for a little while. <laughs> 
And then for our larger fish, uh, like our sand tiger sharks and all of our shark species, even our cobias, um, our cobias are really large fish species that kind of look like sharks. We might see one when they swim by. Um, our barracudas and tarpons, our triple tails, all of those really big fish, we're gonna do something called target feeding for them. So for these sharks here and for everybody else, we're going to take a pair of tongs. These are kind of like barbecue tongs that you might have at your house. And we will tap them against the side of the tank. And it's really organized. It's almost like a little dinner bell for them. We'll come up and they'll actually get in a single file line at the top of our tank. So it's not a feeding frenzy. Um, it's a little drive through where we just put the food right into their mouths with those really long tongs. And they get lots of salmon and mackerel as well. So sharks in the wild don't really need to eat that much. We think of sharks as being uh, apex predators. They're definitely apex predators. They're excellent hunters. And generally there are a lot of larger shark species, but we do have some smaller ones as well. Uh, but sharks are really good at conserving their energy. So they don't have to eat as much food as we do. So in the wild, sharks only eat about two or three times in an entire month. So uh, I don't know about you, but I need to eat three times a day, probably a little bit more than that if I want some snacks, but sharks are like, nope, I'm good. I'm gonna eat twice a month and that is okay with me. Um, but at the aquarium, we feed them a lot more frequently than that. We feed them three times a week. So just by feeding them a little bit less, a little bit more frequently, we can keep their bellies uh, nice and full. That also helps to prevent any conflict going on in the tank here. But if we were in the wild, sharks have lots of adaptations that allow them to be really great hunters um, and survive so well out there in our different ocean environments. So one of those adaptations we're pretty familiar with, and it's gonna be these teeth here. So this is a jaw from one of our sand tiger sharks. And you can see how sharp their teeth are. I have to be careful when I handle this because their teeth are still really, really sharp. But they've always got a fresh set, nice and ready. And that is because sharks can grow and replace their teeth over time. And they can go through about 30,000 teeth throughout their entire lifetime. So you can see all of those layers under there. They always have a fresh set, nice and ready. And that's gonna really help them out when they come across a prey item out in the wild. When our divers get in the tank, they often, uh, they help us clean the tank. So they do all the feeding, they do the cleaning. They work very hard here at the aquarium, uh, but sometimes they vacuum this tank too. And when they do, they find so many shark teeth at the bottom of the great ocean tank. So if you find one that's white in color, that's a pretty fresh tooth. But if you find one that is a little bit darker, um, that is going to be a fossilized tooth. So if you find one that's kind of dark in color, uh, maybe really dark black, that could possibly be millions of years old. Um, so they gather sediment over time. This is what they will look like. So they kind of sit down um, on the bottom of the ocean and absorb all of that sand and sediment. And that's what makes them all dark in color. So sharks have a lot of other adaptations that help them survive in the wild, um, such as camouflage. And it's a little weird for us to think about sharks camouflaging um, because usually when we think of camouflage, we think of lots of color and pattern things that might help uh, some animals blend into reefs. But even when they swim in the middle of the water column, sharks can still kind of hide in plain sight. And that is because of their coloration. So on their backs, they've kind of got a dark gray color. And then on their bellies, it's really bright white. So that is called countershading. Um, and lots of animals in the ocean have countershading as well, like uh, dolphins, some other fish species will have countershading. And basically how it works is, oh, here's another sand tiger coming our way. If I was underneath that shark looking up, I would see their white belly blending in with the light surface of the water. But if I was above this shark looking down, I would see kind of their darker back on top blending in with the bottom of the ocean, all of the sand underneath. Sharks have another really cool adaptation on their skin um, and it covers the entirety of their body and it's called dermal denticles. So dermal means skin and denticles kind of sounds like another word that we might know. Uh, maybe like a doctor that we go see every once in a while, maybe he tells us to floss. Um, it kind of sounds like dentist. So these are what those dermal denticles look like. They're overlapping scales. And they are basically tiny microscopic teeth that cover their entire bodies. So humans, we would look pretty weird if we had teeth all over our body, but sharks pull it off. Um, and these sharks are real, these uh, scales are really important for these sharks because it stops bacteria and parasites from growing on their body. So it keeps them nice and healthy out in the wild. 
Some of you have maybe heard a rumor before that all sharks have to keep swimming all the time in order to survive, but this is not necessarily true for all shark species. Um, some sharks, like our nurse sharks, uh, they have an adaptation called a spiracle. So spiracles are two little holes that are usually on either side of their head, kind of by their eyes. Um, and they are like little tunnels. Our nurse sharks have them. They're swimming past us right now. It allows them to pull water into those tunnels while they're sitting nice and still on the bottom and move oxygen past their gills without having to swim. So uh, some of our nurse sharks have this adaptation and then another one of our animal friends uh, over here has it as well. And hopefully he's still out Yep, he is. <laughs> He's one of my favorites in the tank. Um, his name is Green Bean, and he is our green moray eel. So his name is Green Bean because he looks like a giant green bean. <laughs> and Green Bean has those spiracles as well, so you can kind of see those in action. Um, he's opening his mouth right now, and that's not to bite something, but it's to also help him pull water in through those tunnels, move that oxygen past his gills without having to swim around a whole lot. And similar to how sharks have those dermal denticles, uh, green moray eels have a slime covering. So green beans actually all brown in color, um, but he's covered in a bright yellow slime that makes him look like he's bright green. And this is a, a mucus covering. So if you're not sure what mucus is, um, it's kind of like eel snot. He's covered in a whole bunch of his own snot, which might sound a little bit gross, um, but it's actually really important in keeping him healthy too. It's almost like a built-in sanitizer. This is a pretty good selfie opportunity with Green Bean, too. Um, he's staying nice and still, so if anyone uh, wanted to take that selfie opportunity now, now is a pretty good chance. Green Bean is also nocturnal, so being nocturnal means that he is uh, more active at night than he is during the day. And I just mentioned how much our divers do for us here. They are cleaning the tank, they are doing programs with us, uh, they're feeding the tank. They're doing all sorts of things. So one thing they don't want to do is they don't want to have to come in at the middle of the night to feed green bean here, um, especially when they work so hard during the day. So what we do for green bean is we have a special pipe just for him um, with his long slender body. He's the only one that can fit in this tiny pipe and kind of be able to swim forward and backwards out of it as well. So we'll hide a piece of fish in there for him. And when we check it the next day and see that it's empty, we know that green beans eaten for the day. So green beans got that adaptation that keeps him healthy as well. We do have another friend in this tank that uh, might be taking a nap right now, but we have a reptile in this tank too. And her name is Coretta. She is a loggerhead sea turtle. And uh, Coretta has an interesting story. She was taken off of the beach as a hatchling. So when she was about this big and trying to make it out to the ocean for the first time, uh, she was picked up off the beach and someone tried to take her home and raise her as their pet which is pretty crazy. We definitely want to keep our wild sea turtles wild. Um, and we definitely uh, don't want to take them off of the beaches. But since she was raised in human care her entire life, she doesn't have the instincts that she needs to survive in the wild. And that means she has no natural fear of sharks whatsoever. And she actually likes to steal food from the sharks almost all the time. So to feed Coretta the sea turtle, we have to give her her own spot. Depends on who you talk to. Some people call it her turtle timeout box, but I like to call it her private dining area because she's a very fancy turtle. She gets her own a little uh, crate that gets lowered in the water and uh, she'll get right in. We'll raise it up so she can't get out and she'll get salmon and mackerel in there as well. <laughs> So this is representative of what a healthy ocean ecosystem will look like off of the coast of South Carolina with all of these different types of animals uh, living in here together. Nice and clean environment. Of course, our, our divers work really hard to make it so, um, but there are some animals that we might be able to find that we don't necessarily want to see in our waters here in South Carolina. And that is going to be this really cool looking fish right here. Um, and this is a lionfish. So I mentioned that all of our species in the Great Ocean Tank, they are all native to South Carolina. So that means that they are from here, they've evolved here, they've been here all the time. But our species right here, this lionfish, is not a native species, but it is found in South Carolina. And that's because this lionfish is invasive. So there are different kinds of invasive species, but what makes a species invasive is um, they're really good at doing lots of things. They're really great at uh, surviving different temperatures, different uh, salinities or amount of salt in the water. 
They're really hardy animals. They don't, they're not picky eaters at all. They can eat pretty much anything. And since they didn't evolve here, there aren't any predators that really evolved alongside them. So they don't really have any natural predators here in South Carolina. So these animals are from the Pacific and uh, they are invasive because a few years ago, uh, someone accidentally released them from an aquarium and now their numbers are in the millions in the Atlantic coastline. So not only are they really great survivors, they can survive all sorts of different environments. They can eat pretty much anything. They also reproduce very quickly. They can have uh, about 3 million eggs in one uh, breeding season. So that is what allows our lionfish to kind of take over um, and outcompete some of the native fish that we do find here in South Carolina. So there is another thing aside from our invasive species that we could find in our ocean habitats that we don't really want to see there too. Um, and that can of course be marine debris or in other words, trash. So uh, trash is something that we can find in our ocean environments, even way down in the deep sea, almost 11,000 feet under the surface of the water. So our impact definitely reaches really, really far distances. Um, but the great thing is our impact uh, can also be positive. So making sure all of our trash and recycling ends up right where it should in those proper bins is a really great step. And just ending up nowhere outside. So maybe we live on the coastline, but maybe we live nowhere near the ocean. We still have the ability to impact these ocean environments. Because water is always moving, it's taking things with it. It's going down our rivers and streams and down to our oceans uh, through those waterways. And maybe you want to take it a step further um, and clean up some trash that might not belong to you, and that is awesome as well. If you'd like to do that, uh, you or an adult can download our Citizen Science app. So if you go to the App Store and type in South Carolina Aquarium, you'll find it. And it's called our Litter Free Digital Journal. And it lets you take data on all of the trash that you find during those trash weeks. So uh, that data is really important because we can present that data on what kinds of trash we're finding to our local leaders and change makers, and they can help us even more in. Uh, making a positive impact on our ocean environments. All right, friends, now that I've introduced you to all of my favorite friends in the Great Ocean Tank, I'm still gonna keep my eyes out for uh, some more of our sharks and hopefully get you guys another selfie opportunity with some of our sharks along the way. Maybe find our sea turtle if she's not taking a nap. Um, but in the meantime, I would love to answer all of your questions. I know you guys probably have some really great questions that I can't wait to answer for you. We have some really wonderful questions. And yes, if you didn't get a chance to snap a selfie with any of the friends that Elena introduced us to so far today, I think we'll have a couple of opportunities here and there as we're answering some of these questions. Definitely feel free to do so. And don't forget to post those selfies on Instagram and tag us here at Varsity Tutors, as well as the South Carolina Aquarium for a chance to win that one week virtual summer camp subscription. Now, we had lots of really wonderful questions, but perhaps the most common question of all, and I'm sure that you get this very, very often at the aquarium, how do you make sure that these fish don't eat one another? That is a really, really great question. Um, and while I've got my sand tiger here, if y'all wanted to take a photograph with our sand tiger, now is a great time. Um, but yeah, that's an awesome question and definitely one that we get all the time because it doesn't seem to make much sense. There's so many animals in here. Um, and since it is representative of a real ocean ecosystem off of South Carolina, there's definitely gonna be some predators and prey uh, living together in this ecosystem too. So the big way that we uh, keep it nice and peaceful in the great ocean tank and prevent that conflict from going on is uh, just by keeping it really well fed. So I mentioned that there are about 60 to 70 pounds of food that go into this tank every single time that it is fed um, and target feeding our sharks with those big chunks of salmon and mackerel um, and keeping their feeding schedule consistent three times a week instead of three times a month um, definitely keeps everybody nice and happy in the great ocean tank. Awesome. And we also had some, some students who are doing some really great observing, potentially maybe some, some future scientists are looking to be involved in roles where maybe they're dealing with some of these animals on a more regular basis, who are wondering about some of the characteristics that we saw out of our animals today, and in particular, why green bean and some of our other friends were opening and closing their mouths so often. So could you talk to us a little bit about some of the animal behaviors that we saw? 
Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it's going to maybe differ depending on what animals we're looking at. But with green bean, uh, the reason that he's opening his mouth like that, he's not trying to bite or eat anything. Um, it's part of how he pulls water into his mouth and through those two tunnels, those spiracles on either side. So um, just like sharks don't always have to swim in order to breathe, that's just another way for him to bring that water in. And by bringing that water in, he's bringing oxygen past his gills. So that's really just how he breathes underwater. Um, but for some of our other animals, animals like uh, some of our tiny uh, fish that were kind of hanging out by the chum bucket, um, like our trigger fish. It could be that they are trying to eat something, maybe tiny, tiny little particles that are floating around in the water here, um, especially after they get fed. There's still some food particles that might be floating around a little bit. So some of our smaller reef fish might be doing that to find some food. Awesome. And we also had some students who maybe had the opportunity to join us last lesson when we talked a little bit more about sea turtles and other turtle species who were wondering how you determine where the turtles will stay. So we saw some turtles who were in some very different enclosures and tanks last lesson. Then we had Coretta here in this, in this very, very large, very, very different tank uh, today. So could you talk to us a little bit more about how you decide at the aquarium who goes where? That's a really great question. Um, and thank you all for joining us again for another uh, another tour. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So we do have a sea turtle hospital here. And we get that question a lot um, as to why Coretta is not in the sea turtle hospital. But that's because uh, the turtles that we met last time in the hospital, those are all releasable sea turtles. So they eventually will make their way back out to the ocean. So they're just here for a very short period of time. Um, and we want to limit the interaction that they have in the hospital to other animals and to humans too, because they're in their very important important process of getting healthy and recovering from whatever that uh, illness or uh, injury was. So in Coretta's case, I mentioned she was taken up off of the beach when she was just this big. She didn't even make it out to the ocean yet. So she has actually never seen the ocean in her life. Um, so unfortunately, in that case, um, again, it's illegal to take our sea turtles off of the beach. We want to keep our wild sea turtles wild. Um, but with Coretta's case, she was raised by humans her entire life. So she doesn't have the instincts that she needs to survive out there. And I mentioned that was her lack, total lack of fear of sharks. Um, so Coretta will never uh, be released back out to the ocean. So that's why she lives in our great ocean tank and has lots of space to live out her life in here, as opposed to being in one of our smaller tanks for a shorter period of time. Awesome. Well, that absolutely makes sense and reinforces something we talked a lot about last lesson around making sure that we keep our wild wild and we leave them alone and observe them from a distance when we see them out on our beaches. Uh, we also had lots of questions about those sharks and a little bit of shark behavior as well. So do different species of sharks tend to swim at different levels and is there a reason they might do so? Yes, that is such a good question. Um, yeah, so our sand bar sharks and our black nose sharks are typically going to be more near shore species. Um, so we'll find them anywhere from the shoreline to about 60 feet of depth. And then our nurse sharks are also, even though they're the biggest sharks in the tank, they're going to be more shallow water sharks um, because they like to hang out near reef systems. Um, they also like to hang out in some tropical areas. So maybe you've seen them on a vacation or something in some shallow water areas there. Um, but sand tigers are really, really deep divers and they can go down as far as 200 meters. And that's really, really far down in the ocean. Um, anything from 200 meters and up to the surface is called the photic zone of the ocean. So what that means is that that's where all of the light can penetrate through. And below 200 meters is generally where it gets really dark really fast. Um, so our sand tigers are able to do that. They're one of the species that does have to keep swimming. Um, so they can't stop and use their spiracles like some other species can. They're always swimming and they have really powerful tails. So they can uh, swim very quickly down to the bottom of the ocean. And uh, they're just well adapted to that pressure change as well. Awesome. And then kind of a similar follow-up question, are all of the species that we see in this tank species that would coexist or live in some of the same spaces out in the wild? Definitely. Yeah, these are all species that we find off of our beaches in South Carolina. Um, if anyone's been to South Carolina or really anywhere up and down the, the east coast of the United States, um, it, with the exception of Florida, you might notice that our water clarity is not super great. Uh, maybe not great for snorkeling and seeing all the way down to the bottom, but that is not because our water is dirty. It's because it's really turbid. It's really nutrient rich. So there's lots of currents going on that are stirring up lots of sediment from the bottom. And that's really great. We're so thankful for our murky water because that means uh, that's what attracts all of our wildlife to this area and especially the sharks too. So they love those murky waters because that's where all of the fish are, all of the good nutrients. Um, so uh, 
all of these shark species will live pretty close to each other along our coastline, um, not too far off of our shore. Wow, I definitely never would have expected that murkier waters tend to actually promote biodiversity and more animals that we can see, maybe if we're looking closely. Uh, we, we also had lots and lots of questions around what we'll call kind of our, our animal superlatives. So is there a biggest animal in the tank and a littlest animal in the tank and maybe possibly, I know you mentioned a couple of favorites and it's tough to single them out, especially with green bean listening in in the background there, but any favorite animals in the tank? Who okay, so I would say biggest one in the tank is definitely going to be the nurse shark. Um, and they ours are not quite as large as the species can get uh, overall. They can get to be about 14 feet long. I think that ours are mostly about seven to 10 feet right now. Um, and we do have a tinier nurse shark with us. His name is Fred and he's super cute. He's maybe about five or six feet right now. Um, he's still growing, but he likes to eat from the chum buckets here, even though he's supposed to eat from the tongs um, up at the surface. He likes to eat with all the tinier fish over at the reefs. Um, but our nurse sharks are the largest. I would say our smallest species in the tank is probably going to be the sergeant major fish that we saw. They're just about this big and they have black and white stripes on their bodies and they always love to hang out in the tiny crevices along the reef. It's going to be hard for me to pick a favorite. I know green bean is definitely one of them. Uh, green bean is just so fun to talk about. I also just love telling people that his name is green bean because it's just like the best thing ever. Um, and I also love our sea turtle Coretta and I think I see her at the surface. She's a little bit hard to see right now. She loves to take her naps at this time of day up on the second floor. Um, but I think that Coretta is probably a close second. Awesome. And you actually just spoke with us a little bit about feeding. So could you tell us a little bit more about whether the food that the, the species in there are eating is the same food they'd find in, a, in the wild? Or in some cases, are there some different needs that they have when they're with you in the tank? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so salmon is definitely not going to be a super common species that they would encounter in the wild. Um, salmon is a freshwater fish, so not one that they would find out in the ocean in that saltier environment. Um, but mackerel is a species that they could possibly see out in the wild. Uh, we definitely see a lot of mackerel swimming around our uh, estuaries here in our salt marshes. Uh, we see a few birds carrying them sometimes too. So mackerel is definitely one that they would encounter, um, but salmon not so much. And uh, we definitely don't wanna feed them species that they live with. So that's a part of keeping everybody nice and happy in this tank. Um, but salmon is also really great for protein. So that's another reason that we give our animals salmon. Um, but something that they also wouldn't find in the wild is all of their medicine. So we do give them lots of vitamins, um, lots of vitamins and uh, antibiotics as well. So that's not super a regular part of their diet that they would have in the wild, but that's part of why our animals that live in the Great Ocean Tank uh, tend to have a little bit of a longer lifespan than they would in the wild because we've got a team that is constantly looking after every 550 uh, fish that live in this tank here together. Wow. Well, speaking of keeping everybody happy and healthy and safe and even potentially in the case of when you might need to look at the medical attention needs of some of your species. Uh, how is it that when you need to go in to clean the tank or to care for, for the animals a little more one-on-one, -on -one, how is it that you make sure that your caretakers are safe along the way as well? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so when our divers get in the tank, they always have a safety diver with them. So they can't ever get in by themselves. Um, usually there's always at least three divers in there at a time together. And um, they don't have to worry about the sharks at all, actually. They have a really great relationship with the sharks. The sharks never bother them. Uh, but there is one animal in the tank that they always have to be extremely, extremely careful of. And that is our sea turtle, Coretta. <laughs> and that is because Coretta is so curious all the time when our divers get in the water. She loves to look at their equipment. Um, I was just watching them play a, about an hour ago and uh, she's really curious about the bubbles that come from their oxygen tanks too. So she'll try and swim all over them. Um, and Coretta is 250 pounds. So they have to be careful that she doesn't uh, sit on them by accident. So that is definitely one that they have to be careful of. Um, but whenever we need medical attention for one of the animals in this tank, we actually um, recently did some checkups on some of our puffer fish that live in this tank. And uh, our divers will get in and safely remove them, making sure that they're in a water bin the whole time until they make it down to our surgery suite. And at that point, they'll just make sure that their gills are staying nice and wet. They'll cover them with a wet towel so they're getting uh, lots of water and oxygen when they need it. But they're able to kind of check on their blood, give them a blood test, give them a CT scan, an x-ray, um, some injections or whatever else they would need. 
Wow. So shark bites, not the number one thing to look out for in that great big <laughs> tank full of sharks. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. Now, we also had lots of questions. We talked a little bit about some of these uh, for some of what we'll call the origin stories of the species that we got to meet in your tank. So we got to talk a little bit about Creta. We talked a little bit, I think, about the, the lionfish as well. But in general, uh, how is it that the species under your care end up under your care? What does that process tend to look like? And at what age? do they generally come to your tanks? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So a lot of the time we get um, some of our, our animals from other aquariums and other facilities. And a lot of the time that's gonna be some of our larger shark species that we'll get from other aquariums. Um, but we also do have a permit to go offshore collecting. So we have a boat at the aquarium um, and our dive team gets to go pretty far offshore and see what they can catch. And we've gotten some cool things that way. We've gotten some shark species, we've gotten octopus that way. Um, so we can go offshore collecting as well and have a permit for that. But we also have another exhibit. Oh, I just saw our sea turtle, so I'm going to turn my camera around while I answer that question. She's swimming up to the surface there. There's Coretta. She finally made it to the show. Um, we also have a salt marsh exhibit here at the aquarium, and it's going to be on our second floor. And it's an outdoor exhibit that kind of takes you through what our salt marshes look like here in Charleston uh, from the surface and also underneath. And our salt marsh environments are also really, really important for our ocean ecosystems because they're kind of like a big daycare, but for nature. Um, so they are like really big nurseries for all of these shark species, fish species, uh, really great habitat and foraging ground for sea turtles. Um, so in our salt marsh exhibit, we have a lot of the same species that you are seeing here, but they are babies, they're really small. So we kind of mimic that uh, normal motion of moving from the salt marsh to the ocean in our aquarium. So we'll move those smaller animals to the great ocean tank once they get a little bit bigger. Wow, and we of course have lots of students today who are very interested in animals, interested in learning more about animals, and in many cases, interested in becoming involved, potentially working with animals. So we get this some version of this question pretty much every class, but I'd love to hear from you a little bit outside of maybe some of the divers who are in the tanks, some people who are helping to educate from outside the tanks. What are some of the other maybe perhaps unexpected roles that people at the aquarium take on that allow everything to function and allow us to be here today? That's a really great question. I love that question because um, personally, I feel like growing up, sometimes you get a, this misconception that you have to either be a vet um, or a zookeeper if you wanna work with animals. And that's not true. Um, you can do pretty much anything you wanna do and find what you're passionate about and find a way to connect it to uh, something else that you'd like to enjoy as well, whether that's working with animals um, or another passion of yours. But we definitely have educators here if you're passionate about talking to people and getting people to uh, be excited about all of the amazing things that you're excited about. Um, I definitely have a lot of fun doing it. Um, we have people that work in advancement and marketing. So um, if you if you like designing, if you like photography, if you like any of that kind of thing, um, or sales, you can still work at an aquarium. Um, or if you want to take care of animals, of course, that's our vet side and our biologist side. Um, but we also have a whole wonderful team here of people from all over the place, advancement marketing, uh, working with our guests, working out on the floor, um, you can really find anything that you enjoy and uh, find somewhere to do it where you get to work with animals. Amazing. And as perhaps one of our final questions for today, we also had lots of students wondering different ways that they can get more involved in understanding how, you know, we talked a little bit about picking up litter, maybe even litter that isn't your own litter, uh, and making sure that we're keeping distance from our animals. What advice do we have for students who are interested in learning more about how they can just be better global citizens and make sure that they're taking care of the wildlife around them. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, those are really great ways to start. Um, just being mindful of your everyday choices, whether that is uh, being mindful of where your trash is going or even just using less items. Uh, if that's in your uh, power or in your ability to saying no to some straws or some plastic bags, uh, carrying around a bag with you. Um, sometimes what I like to do is take a bag of trash with me and I'll count throughout the day how many items of trash that I'll use throughout the entire day. So I can look at it all at once um, and it just kind of helps me understand what I'm using and where it's going and all of that as well. Um, but using that litter-free digital journal, if you wanted to clean up some trash around your neighborhood, um, but also a really easy thing to do is just share what you learn with your friends and your family and uh, maybe do those litter sweeps together and, uh, uh, Bring that to your community too, which is a really great community building uh, thing to do as well. 
Awesome. And so for possibly our final question for today, and I think this is going to foreshadow our question on, uh, on when the next class is and how students can join that we got lots and lots of in just a moment. Uh, but are all of the animals under your care at the aquarium aquatic animals? Are they all underwater animals? They are not all aquatic animals. Um, and it's people <laughs> definitely ask us that a lot because they walk in and go to our second floor and they see a big bald eagle there. And they wonder, how could you uh, have a bald eagle in your aquarium? I thought this was an aquarium and that you had aquatic animals. Um, but at the South Carolina Aquarium, we like to focus on all of the different native species and native habitats that we have within our state. So uh, we actually walk you through what uh, the mountain exhibit, the mountain forest, all the way down to the sea and all of the habitats that we have in between. Um, so I think I might have given it away a little bit. <laughs> but our, um, our next uh, program is going to be about our bald eagle. And her name is Liberty. Awesome. And feel free to put check in on our Varsity Tutors site over the next week or so for a posting on that class. But we will be rejoining the South Carolina Aquarium on July 6th to talk a little bit more about Liberty and potentially have Liberty guest star in the class as well. I don't want to give too much away, but uh, we're very, very excited to learn a little bit more about the not so aquatic animals that South Carolina Aquarium cares for. And with that, it is about that time. But thank you so much to Elena and to the entire team at the aquarium. Thank you for everyone who tuned in and asked such thoughtful questions throughout the class. We do hope to see those selfies. I hope we caught a couple of good selfies when Coretta came out to say hello to us. And uh, if you did, don't forget to post them on Instagram and tag us here at Varsity Tutors as well as the South Carolina Aquarium. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys.